Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the origins of life. With me is Dr. Bruce Damer. He is the co-author with David Deemer of a new theory on the origins of life that was featured in 2017 in a cover story in Scientific American. Many viewers will know that I interviewed Bruce. Uh, it was released publicly in early April. 2019. And in that interview, we covered his many interests, which include not only the origin of life, but also space migration, virtual reality, uh, psychedelic drugs. He's uh, quite a pioneer and a polymath and a, a very interesting fellow. And in addition to going more deeply into the origin of life than we did in that initial interview, we'll also be addressing some of the comments that were raised by viewers to that interview as well. And furthermore, we encourage viewers to comment on this one because uh, there'll be several more interviews with Bruce in the future, and uh, he enjoys responding to viewer comments. Now I'll switch over to the internet video. Well, welcome, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be back with you again after uh, a month's uh, hiatus, or a little more than a month by the time our viewers see this. Thank you, Jeffrey. Let's recap, uh, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, a little bit more about your uh, work with David Deemer on the uh, the origin of life from uh, non-living systems. You pointed out uh, that Darwin, uh, over a hundred years ago, close to 150 years ago, suggested that uh, life began in, in uh, volcanic pools. But but you've added quite a bit to uh, Darwin's initial speculation, and let's let's hone in on that. Yes, and in fact, for inspiration, uh, a year or so ago, I went to the Galapagos Islands and clambered through rocks covered with chatter chattering finches to Stevens Bay, where Darwin stood on the, on the deck of the Beagle and, and, and witnessed, sort of observed the Galapagos for the first time and noticed all of the volcanic rocks there and the strange stunted trees. And it was very inspiring because this is when he was a young man in 1835. And, you know, in 1859, he published The Origin of Species, uh, just a phenomenal transformative book, you know, working with Wallace and others. And then in 1871, when he was an old man, in a letter to his friend J.D. Hooker, who was a frequent correspondent with Darwin, he wrote about, uh, I don't know what prompted it, but it was, uh, oh, and if in a big if, if life could, uh, that life might start in a warm little pond somewhere, and I'm not saying this accurately, uh, filled with phosphoric salts, electricity, sources of energy, uh, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, that a protein compound should form ready to undergo more complex changes. And that's his famous little, it's a single sentence. And it, it absolutely nailed it. Charles Darwin nailed it in 1871 with an intuitive flash that he had warm little ponds so that you had reaction energy, you had uh, sort of uh, energy for reactions to happen faster. It had to be little so that things were more concentrated. It had to have the right building blocks together and a source of energy. And the first, the thing you must have is a protein compound forming, which was uh, known to Victorian science, whereas nucleic acids like RNA and DNA weren't really known to Victorian science. But his, the last part of the sentence, which says, such that it is ready to undergo more complex changes, nails it. That's called a wave from equilibrium chemistry, where the protein might start very short and they get longer and longer and longer and add bits. So he was, in a sense, uh, implicating the future of that the protein has to cycle. It had to go through stages. And it's amazing. So in, in the 1990s and 2000s, Dave Deemer established uh, from an intuition that wet-dry cycles in little pools, that 
warm little pools that dry down cause more concentration. And if you have the building blocks for life, which might include amino acids and nucleotides, uh, they can get concentrated and get together. And this has been known for decades. But when he added lipid, which is this membranous material that we're all made out of membranous phospholipid, our bodies, are, we're just basically bags made out mm-hmm. of, or plastic bags of phospholipid carrying around all these molecules. Uh, if, no, if those no, lipids membranes are, are basically fats, aren't they? They're fats. And in fact, fats come from space in the, the asteroidal material that was falling on the Earth at the time. And I have some of it here. We can show your, your viewers. See, mm-hmm. There's a little kind of a sheen at the bottom of this yeah. file. Uh, and it's, it's actually a, a, a ground up exudate. There it is there. Of the Murray mm-hmm. meteorite, which is older than the Earth. So this is a carbonaceous chondrite that fell on the Earth some decades ago, but it, it's been floating around the solar system for 4.6 billion years. That's so before the Earth's formation. And if mm-hmm. I under, un, unscrew this top, so we put it in chloroform, which released all the organics, and I give it a smell, and of course you can give it a sniff too. <laughs> 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 through the ether. Through the ether. Uh-huh. And it's a very s- smoky, smoky smell. And that's the aromatic uh, organics that are in here that were made mm-hmm. in space, made in cosmochemistry, made in the accretion disk of the solar system, uh, in something called sort of interstellar chemistry. And the solar system even today is full of dust and these objects that are crammed with amino acids and, uh, and fatty acids. This is where I was coming to, C10, C12, uh, long chain carbon fatty acids and in this in this material if you put this into a buffered solution with acid it'll release these membranes and then when the pond dries down with the membranous material and the amino acid building blocks uh, it will squeeze them all together in a two-dimensional matrix where the Gibbs Gibbs free energy, it's called changes, or entropy changes from a three-dimensional bulk where everything's just floating around to a two-dimensional little sandwich. And then water will leave through the tops of the sandwich uh, as the pool completely dries down. And then these things shift around, and we can watch them under kind of uh, nuclear imaging. And they start stacking together and click, 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 make the protein compounds, make the nucleic acid make RNA, and that's what we've been doing in the laboratory now, uh, and now in Rotorua in New Zealand last June, where we stitch together using just wet dry cycling in vials. Actually, in there it was in hot spring conditions, it was set in a heat block in a 93 Celsius yeah. bubbling pool, and we get these long stringy chains of RNA that when the pool refills, or in the case of when I put a drop of water back in here, you get trillions of little compartments forming. I could do this with this right here, and it would form trillions of compartments that contain, some of them contain stuff, they contain polymers. And this is like a rolling of the roulette wheel. So an individual polymer-containing vesicle or little little compartments, we call it a protocell. And those are in their trillions, and they're floating around, and they're wobbling apart and losing their contents. And the ones that are stable, that hold on to their contents, can go around for another ride. They can go back down, dry down, like sludge in the bottom of your bubble bath, squeeze together, and form the layers again, make the polymers again, and then go back into the bubble phase. And then, and it's a combinatorial chemistry engine that we've discovered that nature has. And when you're in the hot spring geyser environment, those pools are filled on a clockwork basis, and that's exactly what we do in the laboratory. Like it's, oh, it's 35 minutes have gone by, time to rehydrate. And if we do that four times, we get RNA hundreds of, of chain units long through this cycling protocell system. It's just breathtaking mm. work, and it's just, we found that what we think is the engine of creation itself, or the they say, or a genesis engine, or a biogenesis engine. 
I've been to Rotorua in, in New Zealand. I remember staying in a hotel room where just like right out the window, maybe 40, 50 feet from my window, there was a geyser erupting on a regular basis. Yeah, the town of Rotorua is, is amazing. It's on the North Island of New Zealand. And there mm -hmm. in the city hall, there's a big tower with enormous speakers and horns. And that is actually to warn the town to evacuate. Because eventually oh. the whole place is going to get blown up because there's a mag magma plumes and there's, there's immense, there's a lake that used, was an eruptive caldera. And eventually that whole area is going to just blow to smithereens. So, uh, because the whole town is underlain by hydrothermal yeah. systems. It's sort of like Yellowstone Park. It, it is only more active. Uh, so uh -huh. even in Auckland, so in Auckland, if you go to the big museum there, you can go into this shaker house, which will simulate the eruption of volcanoes in the Bay of Auckland itself, where the city will be absolutely destroyed by this. So th there will be a huge eruption. There'll be an enormous plume coming out of the harbor and then an explosion. And then the blast wave will wipe out Auckland. And so every Auckland, school child goes and experiences this so that they know when told to evacuate, when you see this thing coming out of the bay, you better leave. Well, it suggests that in a sense, if, if your theory is, is correct, that life emerged out of almost violent conditions with this volcanic activity. Yeah, violent and quiescent. So the, the, the opposite of violent is quiescent, uh, which means means that so if you're you're in Mount Lassen National Park, Volcanic Park in Northern California, you see this huge volcano in the background that erupted in 1917. Yeah. And then there's the Bumpus Hell hydrothermal field. And it's fairly quiescent in a way. It stuff is filling, stuff is flowing, it's going on for years and decades. And pools are changing and shifting and they're all different colors and pHs and rates. And it's actually quite pleasant. You know, people, that's why people love to, to go to Yellowstone or Bumpus Hell and watch it. Because it's so fascinating and it's nature's chemistry set. And mm -hmm. unlike any other place on earth, you know, it, and it just, when you see it, you think something is being cooked up here. Something's being done here. And just the colors of the rocks and the chemistry and new minerals are forming everywhere. And it's the richest in, environment for chemistry on a planetary surface by far. It's the most dynamic environment. So mm -hmm. we should expect that, uh, that hydrothermal fields on the land are where life uh, can start. We really should expect it. It seems to be obvious on the surface. I have to admit, it, it must be, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, I, I read that uh, scientists had come up with a whole new theory because deep inside the earth they found living cells. So they thought perhaps life was created deep uh, uh, under the earth. Yeah, there's, there's several competing hypotheses that, that scientists are working on. Uh, the deep biosphere origins doesn't have a whole lot of people working on it or, or available experiments to do. Because mm -hmm. if you're stuck in the rock, if you're, a, 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 say, a halophile, which are salt-loving, and you're stuck in the rocks, it's really hard to imagine the chemistry of the combinatorics that I just described actually being possible. There's no cycling yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. And then an, an alternate hypothesis has been these black and white smoker vents, those chimneys at the bottom of the ocean yeah. that are oh, yeah. blowing out. And, and it's another kind of a hot spring, but it's deeply sequestered in salty water. And that was suggested by Jack Corliss in 1982, the discoverer of the thermal vent who just visited Dave and I last year, uh, it was suggested that that's possibly where life could start. Why? Because you have all these chemical gradients. You have heat. Uh, you have chemical gradients. You have a kind of battery operating uh, between potentially uh, between different pHs. You can mm -hmm. have these sort of rock towers, which might contain little compartments. Uh, but truthfully, in the last 30 years, uh, the community that has been building simulations of this in the lab where they actually have a pressure chamber and they're growing these chemical gardens. They've been unable to uh, prebiotically uh, plausibly form the building blocks 
So, mm-hmm. so their, their challenge is to take CO2 and what's called, fi- uh, called fixing CO2, where you turn CO2 and ammonia and other things into the building blocks of amino acids, say, say like alanine. And they might be able to get trace amounts, but it's not really simulating what it's like at the vents. So they get maybe a trace amount of one thing, but then they can't get them to stitch together. Because why? Because you need to de- dehydrate to do that. Ah. There's no other way. You need to remove water so that those things can get stitched together. And in your body, every nanosecond of the day, there's enzymes that are removing water to allow the bonds to form between RNA, DNA, uh, peptides, you know, peptidal bonds and amino acids. And it's like kicking the water out using energy, uh, mm-hmm. which is the trick life learned to do. Yeah. But deep in the oceans, there's no way to form those and there's no way to form the little vesicles the little membranous vesicles because the seawater just basically crunches them all down because it's like soap if you try to wash your hands with soap seawater turns to curds well do you think the seawater in in the world four billion years ago was the same as it is today the geologists tell us yes uh Mm -hmm. then in fact minerals formed uh, that are or, you know that they can collect from 3.7 or 3.5 billion years ago indicate a salty sea that also had dissolved iron and had what are called divalent cations and magnesium and potassium and things like this which actually inhibit the chemistry of, of sort of prebiotic mm-hmm. chemistry we're looking for and we did this at Yellowstone we we formed the little vesicles in Yellowstone waters I went to Yellowstone scooped the waters put them in the vials and shook the vials and I could see the milky milkiness that I knew I was forming trillions of compartments in in different hot spring waters we took them back we imaged them we wet dry cycled them with the Yellowstone water and it it was able to encapsulate DNA and then Dave went down to the dog beach at Santa Cruz took seawater and filtered it through a millipore filter and then tried it with seawater and it just crystallized and collapsed on all those same mm-hmm. vesicles. So we published a paper. Uh, it basically, it's fairly definitive. I mean, you just can't make the compartments. So you can't make the building blocks easily. You can't polymerize them into the chains of things that can do jobs and you can't put them in capsules to select them. So you can't do any of the steps it would take to get to life in a sea environment. And then the last thing is a real problem for an ocean origins. Say you did get some kind of weird proto-life that could emerge there. It gets blown out into the ocean into a dilute cold bulk where it just starves. You know, there's, it lo- leaves the heat environment, leaves all those chemicals, and it, there's nowhere for it to go. Whereas on mm-hmm. land, the little protocells form mats. They form communities which float around between pools and can be blown even across the landscape as a dried film. So you have this distribution across the landscape and evolutionary things happening in different environments that are then shared, which is exactly how biology works now. And so the Mm -hmm. landscape supports uh, distribution and evolution and recombination. And it's just, it, it shows a full path to the complexity of the microbial community. Well, one of the points that you made in our previous interview was that uh, it's necessary to have a, a colony of these protocells. It's not uh, life isn't going to emerge because one single protocell manages to uh, construct DNA. It, it requires probably millions or billions of them all working together. Yes, and this is the the big philosophical role, if you will for this science. You know, in, in 1917 to 1919, uh, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity was, was shown in 1919, 100 years ago, uh, in the eclipse of 1919. In fact, his his letters are now being published online where he writes to his, his mother about this. You know, mm-hmm. he's a very excited, relatively young, young man at the time, uh, which led to the theory of relativity coming into the culture in the 1920s, and that helped to roll the modernist movement in the 1920s, where everything's relative. There's no absolute kings or gods or popes. And everything's changing. We've got radio, women's lib, we've got stock trading, we've got the Bauhaus, we've got fascism, we've got new forms of governance, and we've got national socialism rising eventually, and you've got communism. And 
huge chaotic world, new arts. So the 1920s was a really d- dynamic decade and partly made so by relativity, which n- nobody understood, but mainly saying that, well, even time is flexible and bendable and space is flexible. So it was an exciting idea for the culture of the 1920s. And what we feel is that that this exciting idea for the 2020, one of them and from science, could be that there was no common ancestor at the origin of life, only a common community, i.e. that if you have a little individual flimsy protocell and solution, it's going to fall apart pretty quickly. But when it's stuck together in an aggregate with other millions or trillions of other protocells, that aggregate can survive those conditions. Mm-hmm. And, and a reaction happening in one protocell can send products through diffusion to other protocells. And so the whole unit becomes a network effect, which is much more, it's, it's one of the only mechanisms that life has staying away f- from degradation or the vicissitudes of the second law mm-hmm. of thermodynamics, which break things down. The network sharing effect, it's well known. It's why the internet is so powerful as a collective, but an individual yeah. computer is not that powerful. So, so we have a common ancestor that had a symbiotic start of multiple simpler proto-entities, and then the entire thing emerged as a community doing something called niche construction, where it constructs its own niche that it lives in, modifies it for the benefit of the community, like our cities do for us. That's mm-hmm. niche construction. So that we're able to now propose to, to science and to society, and I just came back from Cambridge, England, to present this for the first time to worldwide evolutionary biology, which was the symbiotic start or the common communal start through niche construction and a network effect uh, is a new way to see biology and evolution itself. That they're looking through the lens of individuals in competition is is not a complete picture. And Victorian Mm -hmm. science was studying, you know, lions on the, you know, hunting gazelles on the plains of Africa. And this was the metaphors. If you read Origin of Species, it's full of these metaphors from dog breeding to uh, animals hunting other animals. But but Darwin didn't understand the consortium or the consortia basis for the microbial world and for the plant world. And so Victorian science got itself a little biased because it said, well, animals are the things and they're just eating stuff in the environment. Well, that environment is all collaborative. It's competitive, but it's largely a blend of massive communal collaboration microbes in the soil and plants and a huge sharing system mycelia share stuff between uh, groups of trees and they heal sick trees so the overall forest health is better and then grazers came along to eat through it and compete as as animals do but they're only a tiny fraction of the living world and they're only temporary you know most of earth's history is the microbial mat consortium model for at least 10 billion years that that's going to be the dominant model so what I proposed in those four essays that I sent you earlier, four blog essays, was a build-up to rethinking evolution itself using a new lens. And the way it comes into the 2020s is that if we have a communal start, a common community is necessary, then our survival and our thriving as a civilization is totally dependent on the health of communities and the network effect, not on isolated individuals in competition. Now, some of our viewers uh, in the previous interview uh, assumed because uh, of this line of argumentation that you're an advocate for what uh, uh, politically has sometimes been called the new world order, that we should have, you know, a common community on the whole planet, that all of humanity should work together. But uh, many people feel they're afraid of this. They think that it, it's going to rob them of or their community. Of, of its own unique uh, national identity or individuality. Well, what's interesting is, is we're seeing both. We're seeing mm-hmm. that, in fact, that has occurred. They are already living. All of us are living in this order because of these devices that we're seeing here. These smartphones have a common protocol, so you can call anyone on the planet and have this wonderful kind of visual interface. That is a world order. All mm-hmm. these tools and infrastructure, common cafe lattes everywhere on the planet. That's a kind of world order. 
common languages, common cultural norms, or the fact that we we each inculcate thousands of cultural norms and stories across cultures that we don't even remember where they're from. So that world order is here, and it's 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 healthy. Uh, the political side, which is politics is often based on a culture of division and, and yeah. opposition, right? Team sports is not as dysfunctional as politics. Team sports is very collaborative. And when you watch athletes talking on, on the news, when you watch fighters, wrestlers, boxers, they're pretty darn humble. I mean, you know, certainly some of them are more, more flowery, but they know that they're in a system and that one day they're going to get, you know, they're going to get beaten up pretty badly by somebody. So they're actually reasonably humble and about their own capabilities or their own recent victories. And they're reasonably deferential to other fighters in the wrestling or boxing arena. They're humble people. Uh, in politics, we have the problem. The politics and ideology and religion, which survive and, and, and thrive on, in a sense, predating on separation. And perhaps mm -hmm. the, the social media and, 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 as I said the last time, conspiracy theories, they're set up to predate, to create anxiety and fear, and if it le if it leads, it leads kind of thinking, and making shit up, you know, uh, fake news and all that sort of stuff, and it's actually super destructive. So what I think people are 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 afraid of is world government becoming like a Big Brother, becoming fake news, becoming like the so-called leadership that we so-called elect. They're afraid of that, and they should be afraid of that because that's absolutely toxic and nonsense you know you can get one bad you know deeply wounded leader in a country and you'll have ruined cities as a result of that, we should take that very seriously and mm -hmm. so com but coming from the bottom up we are now an internetworked progenote the name carl woes gave the first set of protocells which we're using carl's term from 1977 the progenote the progenote the the thing before life he predicted he's he did an, a thought experiment and said there must be an entity that takes you from non-life to life and it has to be communal and it has to share a lot of stuff and all the genes are done crossing horizontally because there's no individuals that can divide themselves and pass down lines but it has to somehow cycle and and uh be selected and grow and and that i think is what we're on the path to now the progenote so the progenote prerogative, I call it, or prerogative, is that the whole planet may have, uh, the living biosphere may have started this way, and that things that are in opposition to the health of communities and networks are in opposition, or they're a threat to life itself. And, and in the case of humanity, they're a threat to the viability of our civilization and the ability for us to get cafe lattes everywhere, which really, when it comes <laughs> down to it, that's what people care about, right? <laughs> well, we wouldn't have this uh, program on YouTube where it's available all over the world if, if it wasn't for this uh, common infrastructure that we share. So I, I totally understand what you're saying about the new world order is is here, but it's it's more of a uh, a substructure. It's not really a uh, command and control new world order. Yeah, and I think that people are afraid of, so there, there was a book, and this is veering into politics. I was on a flight to the country of Qatar in January, and I sat next to a man, uh, I think it's Larry or David Gross, and he was a professor at, at, at Annenberg School of Communications at USC, where, University of Southern California, where I actually went. And his brother, I think his brother is, or his father is David Gross, uh, who won the Nobel Prize, or maybe his brother won the Nobel Prize, but his father wrote a book called Friendly Fascism. It was published in mm. 1979, 1980. And it basically, and this is veering way into politics, uh, said that fascism of the 1930s, uh, which is overt, or the fascism in a sense, the, the dictatorial control of a Joseph Stalin is very much in the public's imagination. But it's not the type of fascism that exists today, and this is is that there would be he believed there would be a kind of friendly fascism. Fascism was with a friendly face that would kind of be undercover, but it would still do the things that fascism does. And then Ronald Reagan came, 
And to his horror, he saw all this. This was predicted in this book come to pass. Mm. And I, I'm not a really a political person and everything, but it does seem as though what people are afraid in world government and things like this, and this will get a lot of comments, is the old-fashioned kind of Big Brother thing. But that's not going to happen. That that's too overt, and that failed as a model. So if you were a if you were a crafty political leader wanting to take over a whole sector, you wouldn't use that model. You would use a different model. You would cloak everything in consumerism and in finance and in control of media, but it would be very soft because you don't want to raise hackles. And, and you can if effectively take over the narrative of society this way. So anyway, it's not my bailiwick, and please don't anyone expect that I know what I'm talking about. But I was just <laughs> struck by meeting meeting yeah. Dr. Gross and hearing about his father, and then I read the mm -hmm. book Friendly Fascism, and uh, Chris... Um, uh, what's his name? The, the the current like real fighter for for rights, uh, Chris. Uh, anyway, he he wrote an introduction to the new volume of this. Uh, oh. But all of all of that is designed. I mean, that system is a, a well, in a sense, craftily designed to predate on individuals. And the the mm. the movie, the documentary hyper hyper normalization produced by the BBC a few years ago pretty much goes into this this territory mm -hmm. too much better than I can. I'm just a lowly origin of life theorist. Well, let's talk uh, uh, more about uh, the theory of evolution, because I, I have a, a sense that for you, uh, evolution is kind of a bedrock theory, as it is for most people in biology. And uh, one of my understandings of that theory is... is um, uh, I think it's called punctuated evolution. And, and the idea is that living beings will, you know, they'll expand into their environment until they create a crisis, which may lead to their extinction and then the evolution of new species. Yeah, I think this is a term I must believe is coined by Stephen Jay Gould years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, when Steve... Steve and I, I met him once. I went to his laboratory. Mm -hmm. I'd invited him to come to the Burgess Shale where I was holding a conference where we literally mm -hmm. climb up to this fossil quarry. So the discoveries in the Burgess Shale suggested that there was a sudden, they call it the Cambrian or Cambrian explosion of body forms of the first animals that had any size, that had vision, that had flaps to swim with or predators. Yeah. And, uh, there were carnivores and herbivores and the oceans could support this kind of animal biota, and this was 535 million years ago. So for, he wrote a book called Wonderful Life about the discovery of the, at the Burgess Shale by James, James Dulo Walcott in the early 1900s and then other, other people working on it and suggested maybe that it was a punctuated, uh, it was a, it was a rapid change. Uh, mm -hmm. since that time, uh, in a, since the genetic record and the fossil record has shown that it probably wasn't so dramatically punctuated. Oh. Uh, but, on the other hand, in the origin of life itself, any any innovation or discovery during the progenote period, and we have a name for that period, we call it the progenian. We've come up with mm -hmm. a new non, non-rock record, non-geological era called the progenian, the boot-up phase of life. That is a living potential laboratory to study this whole thing. So the challenge we have put out to the world now is to grow progenotes in the laboratory and watch mm -hmm. their evolution happen in the dishes. And they're not alive yet. They're, they're chemical systems able to express very vague functions of, of a living world. They might have protogenomes. They might make products and they, may, they would grow. There would be an increasing mass of protocells over time that might crash down because of a stress and then recover. And then you sequence the little sludge and find out that something came up because of the stress you put the system under. And, and so you're doing what's called chemical evolution. So it's not living evolution, but, but it's a laboratory. It's where you can piece apart evolution from physical self assembly, from selection and watch it happen in real time in, in these systems and model it on the computer as well and have it go in parallel. And we're hoping that uh, Google's expressed interest in building a software version of this, what we call Genesis Engine, 
so that it can inform mm. experimentalists what to do in the chemistry and go back and forth and back and forth. And, and so we can actually do tests of punctuated equilibrium. We can do tests of, at the most simplest reduced level, we can see how evolution cranks up. And if, if, uh, you post for your listeners the, uh, the four blog articles for the extended evolutionary synthesis project that was just presented yeah. in, Cam- in the University of Cambridge. Um, the first blog article is called The Origin of Evolution. We'll put them in the comments section right under this uh, uh, video for viewers who want to check that out. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. But go ahead. I've interrupted you. So, so we're at a breakthrough phase. And, and it's similar to, you know, so Albert Einstein had come up with the theories of relativity. And in the 1920s, there were meetings uh, where quantum, you know, quantum theory was proposed. And by the 1930s, they were testing it with these atom smashers, breaking, breaking atoms and nuclei up, which became the basis of uh, particle physics in the, the 20th century. But we're on the verge in 19, uh, 2019 here, of creating a, a, the atom smasher for biology, i.e., we can start from scratch with the protocells, cycle them, move them around, and watch the emergent phenomena. Take them apart, put synthetic biology uh, designed little simple enzymes or simple autocatalytic cycles that Stuart Kaufman might describe. Put them in and watch what happens. And they could be big combinatorial machines with thousands of individual chemical cells cycling, mm-hmm. wet, dry, and things like this, microfluidics based, perhaps, or droplet based. And we can build engines like cyclotrons, but for biology itself. So this could be 21st century. Great. Um, oh, it's so exciting. We're on the edge of it. And when we talked last time about that PI. I am thing that probability shaping yes. interconnection and memory are the sole cycling system that can generate all of this, including potentially even consciousness or uh, uh-huh. everything. All everything that we're in is potentially this PIM thing. But yeah. I'm, I'm going on and on here, but uh, we're really at an exciting time here in 2019. I happen to view a, a discussion between you and uh, another friend of mine, Bernardo Kastrup, was made about a year ago, and Bernardo posted it on YouTube. And I interviewed Bernardo just a few days ago, so that by the time people are watching this interview, they'll be able to see that one. And in it, he talked about you and uh, your theory, and he... Uh, he's very big on the development of life from non-living systems. He thinks that uh, the notion of a colony of uh, progenotes uh, suggests that whatever uh, progress is made by the colony, it gets banked. It gets saved, whereas if an individual were doing it by themselves and, and, and they die, well, then everything is lost. But uh, in a colony, the... The, the accomplishments are, in, in effect, the colony itself uh, is a form of memory. Yeah, and this is often termed as epigenetics or niche construction theory. And, and, and this is, so evolutionary biology often had this very strict dogmatic approach uh, mm-hmm. called the, the standard synthesis or the modern synthesis, where anything that is an innovation in biology must be transferred down through the genes to the subsequent generation. There's no other information transfer mechanism. So that's, yeah. that would be the position of Richard Dawkins, for example, but not the condition of Kevin Leyland or John Oling Smee or the people in the extended evolutionary synthesis group, which are saying, no, there's more, there's epigenetics, there's plus gene, there's plasticity, there's horizontal gene transfer, and there's niche construction. And those are all carrying information and, and affecting. And sure, when a cell divides and it's distributing that huge load of, of information content to a successor, yes, it's there, but there is other things. There are other things. And no one's questioning mm-hmm. Darwin's insights at all. We're just we're making this more nuanced and sophisticated based on what we see. And the origin of life in Cambridge, as of last month, was bolted on you know, a plausible, testable hypothesis for life's origin was bolted onto evolutionary biology for the first time. And now they're one unit in, in, in that, at least that community. 
So now we can uh-huh. treat this as a single thing and we can rewind evolution to see where it might have started and how yeah. seeing where it, how evolution started is our understanding of where it went. Mm-hmm. Now, the d- distinction between you and uh, and my friend Bernardo, I think, would be this. I, I'm pretty sure that you would maintain that consciousness evolved. It's part of an evolutionary process. And as cells uh, and uh, organisms became more complex, consciousness uh, emerged out of that process as an epiphenomenon. Whereas Bernardo would say, no, consciousness was there before the first project you note that uh, before any of this could occur, there had to be consciousness. Now, of course, that's sometimes called uh, panpsychism, I believe is the term. When I've gone to conferences that talk about this, like science of consciousness or science and yeah. duality. Um, I mean, it's a nice and it's a nice notion, but it's not testable. So mm-hmm. how are we going to test that? How, how are we going to you know, is there a measure for consciousness? Could you take a cube of gas that didn't have any biology in it and put sensors on it and say, we're detecting a conscious field in that cube of gas? Uh, what is consciousness? How is it detectable? You know, is consciousness just a phenomenon of, of human primate evolution in this little compartment, which is very heavily visually centered, not olfactory yeah. and not touch centered and i think that what people are doing it's a wish that they have but it's Mm -hmm. almost like creating a new god it's almost like saying well we were made there's a creator and it's called consciousness instead of there being a a old guy in a beard or turtles or something they're creating a new god because humans like to do that i mean they Mm -hmm. uh, but i think it's it's a form of dissociation of of Mm -hmm. what is so if you say, well, the universe is conscious and every atom is, then are we less, are we then less responsible? Well, th- that would be panpsychism to say that every atom has a measure of consciousness, but Bernardo is actually not a panpsychist. He would call himself a metaphysical idealist. He would say that, that, uh, Rather than atoms have consciousness, he would say that consciousness is a, a necessary condition before we can even have any experience of anything. The only thing we know is through consciousness. Therefore, consciousness is uh, primordial. It's the primitive. It's uh, the. It's not necessarily God at all, but it, it is. Uh, you, if you can come up with an example of any kind of an experience that occurs outside of consciousness, that, that would be a, a, a disconfirmation. And, uh, he's sort of suggesting it's logically Im- implied by you know, a philosophical analysis of, uh, the nature of things. But experience, say, in the progenote world. Yeah. Is a, is a very, very faint trace of chemicals moving across membranes that are triggering interactions. Experience mm-hmm. in the mouse world is a lot of sniffing, not a lot of forward planning and cognition, because I know I trap mice every day, and they're the same every time, and I trap the same mouse every day, and and there's there's not a lot of sort of learning going on in these this mouse colony. Um, right. And it's heavily... It's sensing or it's, its experience is heavily tuned to how it's evolved and the environment it's in. And then human, you know, human consciousness is heavily tuned to our predilections and our cultural conditioning and everything. So I can't see that there's any solid footing on that whatsoever. I think it's, it's, it's a gradient of you're going from sensing to active sensing through nervous systems that build up maps and then allow learning in the organism to then allow patterning back on the world. And then you're gradually getting a boot up of, of more processing sensing up to the point where there's, there's cognition and there's planning, but it's, it's, I think it's the most uh, parsimonious, most plausible thing because we can actually test uh, awareness or experience at the levels of animals all the way down to bacterium. We can test it. And we can test it, as Stuart Hameroff points out, he can introduce a simple chemical that will remove this consciousness very quickly because he's an anesthesiologist. 
that's how yeah. Stuart got interested in all this. And you've had him on the show, of course. And, many times. Uh, yeah. Many times. So it's very friable and malleable. And other compounds change our consciousness. You know, everything we drink and eat. So I think that, that this idealism claim is on extremely shaky ground. I mean, and, and, and I asked, well, why it's not, it's not testable and it's, it, it, there's so, they're, they're not defining even what experience is. And it's very sloppy for me. It's intellectually extremely sloppy. Uh, mm-hmm. when we have, when we have a great rich panoply of just, just describing the full texture of what experience is and what animals are. And an earthworm's, you know, an earthworm's consciousness, if you could call it that, is through the skin. It's sensing chemically through the skin. It doesn't have a visual system. So an earthworm, an intelligent earthworm from another star system would come and say, how can you be conscious? Because you can't exquisitely detect the world around you. Well, Mm -hmm. we've got, we've got vision and we can do geometry and the earthworms will say, well, why would you want to draw straight lines? What, what, absolutely what purpose would that serve so their whole predilection is you know you don't even know what consciousness is All visual beings with no skin sensing right yeah try to get to the stars with that you know <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well aren't you possibly confusing information processing with consciousness i, I mean an earthworm is certainly processing information uh and we assume that there's some consciousness but uh we i think it's fair to say a computer your iphone for example that you're using right now to record this interview uh is also processing information but we don't assume uh, that the iPhone itself is conscious in the sense that it's it feels like something to be an iPhone well here here's another I think this is a, this huge bias in here because yeah. like it like an I if you unplug if I had left my iPhone unplugged and I just had plugged it in after another hour it would go dead right mm-hmm. but the same thing could happen with a human you know, if I was in a room where the windows were sealed uh, and there was no way to, or oxygen to get in, I'd be dead in a certain amount of time. I would run out of the oxidant battery that I need. So yeah. we are just as, as in, at, at that level as, as friable in a sense as any technological device. So we're, we're turn onable, turn offable machines. You know, it can be, can be demonstrated. I think here's where this comes from. All this idealism and panpsychism here's where it comes from so yeah. people and, and we'll get a lot of comments on this of course no doubt <laughs> i have not studied this stuff for yeah. like many people have studied i think that people have these extraordinary non-dual experiences and extraordinary uh sort of uh non-ordinary experiences in in some point in their lives either endogenously uh, from an internal system or exogenously or from drugs, you know, powerful drug experience or through practice, which is an endogenous mm-hmm. form. And then they, they get in touch with a, a bigger system, a huge field. And I've been yep. in touch with this field lots of times, lots of times. Mm-hmm. I have an interaction. Mm-hmm. I have a relationship with that field that goes back now almost 20 years. Uh, and, and, endogenously and exogenously i just go into that field i i'm with it and that field is phenomenal it's 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 in relationship to humans i mean fundamentally sometimes the field is in relationship to something else but i don't sort of make the leap that suddenly there's a whole new reality level that that transforms me into becoming an idealist or a panpsychist yeah because i'm i I think that that's a form of not, it's a form of being, uh, what would you say, uh, self, uh, bef- bef- befoozlement. But you have this, <laughs> yeah. you have this huge opening, then you mm-hmm. fall back into your normal schmaltzy self in the awakened, in, in the less awakened awareness, and you walk through the world and you go, wow, that was amazing, man, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. And you then, then dissociate from that and then you assign that with words and memory and description 
you create a structure, a mental structure around that experience, and you say, that was X. And that shows why. And that's what how things really are. Because you've yeah. actually left the field. You're no longer connected to it. And you're making shit up, partially. And you're interpreting it through very <laughs> constricted mental filters. And yeah. you're writing shit down and, and everything. And you're mm-hmm. actually dumbing down the experience all the way to here. And yeah. then you have to defend it, right? And you have to defend the experience and, and sell it. Some people do sales and marketing. It's called religion right. uh, around yeah. it or, or belief systems. And I think we just get caught in this thing over and over again, this sort of cosmic giggle, that we come to a phenomenal awakened awareness union with a thing, and then we dumb the darn thing down and 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 create human culture around it, which then completely corrupts it away. And I think that the, this this idea of when when you hear academics sort of talking in these terms, I think yes, they may have had a moment of com- of absolutely exquisite connection but now they've put it into you know they want to put it into peer-reviewed articles and it's lost it it it, it is lost all its stuffing and Mm -hmm. i I would just suggest in a way to uh, people that are undergoing these transitions pause for a minute pause for a minute go back try to re-simulate that state that you're in and then picture yourself and so I, i can give an example I was in one of these states where I was in complete union with this uh, phenomenal energy system. Absolutely exquisite. Just no form at all. Just the pure energy. And then into my consciousness creeped a lesson, which was it was a vision of myself in some, you know, two, three days or weeks in the future, writing crib notes about the experience, trying to, hmm. trying to capture it. And I just yeah. burst out laughing. It was like, this is impossible. You cannot do that. I, it, me mm. trying to write this down. So I just <laughs> right. said, don't even bother. <clears throat> don't even bother. So what I would suggest is for people who go into these uh, extraordinary states, uh, try to capture the fundament of what it actually is. Don't, don't dumb it down and bring it to the level of language and things. And when you get down, try to, to capture that essence and to relive that essence and allow it to be live in you and, and, and overcome the, re- because it's a bigger, smarter thing than you are. That's why it's a non-ordinary state. And we don't know where it comes from yet. And sometimes I've been in that state and it's basically told me, it's like, bang my head, don't cough, you know, monkey. Don't try <laughs> to crystallize this. Don't try to materialize this too soon. Be- just experience it. Just become it. Yeah and learn, and it will transform you, it will heal you, it will do all these things. But if you come out and you write your crib notes, you'll completely lose it. So, mm-hmm. and so I see, I see this all the time, and, and I almost want to like shake people and say, the cosmic joke is the following, that you open to an extraordinary state where you had some kind of non-dual union with a greater thing. Maybe it's the network made by PIM that we we're just now sensing. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's that. But the cosmic joke is that, one, you completely forget about it. Like within three days, the greatest experience of your life is gone from your memory. Right? And you only remember it when you're going back into that state. Like, I was here before. right? Yeah. And, and, but the other cosmic giggle is that the humans do all these crazy things trying to codify and write stuff about it and papers and, mm-hmm. and write giant you know, impenetrable philosophy books and religious systems and neo-religious systems. And they try to do that. And it's the giant cosmic giggle. I'm sure that they, yeah. the cosmos, whatever it is, is like, yeah, there they go again. <laughs> well, well, let me ask you this question, Bruce. I know a number of viewers have written and they said, well, Bruce Damer is a materialist. Uh, so let me ask you point blank. Do you, do you consider yourself a materialist? Um, if it, that uh, I believe that we need a material substrate to run all this on and that that material substrate has a lineage, has a starting point and has properties. Absolutely. I yeah. think that an OS oh. needs hardware to run on. 
Normally, uh, though, the definition of a materialist is like that, that material, that's the basement. That's the ground floor level. The, I think philosophers would call it a primitive, that the, it, the reality is made fundamentally out of matter. And, and you just told me that in your vision, you heard uh, a, a message telling you not to materialize things. So maybe, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe you're not a materialist. Not to mentalize. Me- oh, so mentalize. In, in but you said materialize. It. You said materialize. It's on the recording now. Well, if, if it, my little crib notes are some sort of materialization. But- <laughs> but th- but this is we're getting down to the heart of things because some people say the whole universe all of reality is basically mental in nature that's what my friend bernardo would say and i think what i hear you saying no no it's material in nature that's the bottom line well what i'm holding in my hand so uh yeah. this is one of the demonstration pieces that i bring to these conferences this is beautiful non- Non-dualism. Deepak really got into this. Deep, Deepak yeah, actually look explained, he explained this to his audience and it was just wonderful. Uh-huh. He did a beautiful job. Uh, crypto uh, you know, he just, he did a beautiful job when we were on uh, Facebook live together. So this is the, uh, so I held this up at Sand at Science and Non-Duality two years ago and said, I know that this crowd is into groundless ground, but, <laughs> but I wanted to bring, <laughs> do this. And I passed it around the audience and, and yeah. I said, what you're holding in your hand is your common ancestor. Those little striations, those little textures here that are moving along are laid, they're stromatolites. They're, they're laid down by microbial mat biofilms three, over three billion years ago and preserved mm-hmm. in this rock from the Pilbara in northwestern Australia. And what you're holding in your hand is some of the oldest evidence for our common ancestor. And it really grounded the audience that we can have, we can have anything that goes in our heads. But when you hold this is, this is where we came from. This, Mm -hmm. we know, we know this it's in the fossil record. And this grounds people like you can, you can be in all the elaborate philosophies you want. It's, It's like the difference between string theorists and people in working on the standard model. The string theorists yeah. are in a virtual world. They're they're way out there trying to come up with a mathematical solution, but they may have gone down one of the world the history's most elaborate scientific rabbit holes. And mm-hmm. I would suggest that philosophy has the same predilection to go down these rabbit holes or holes in the sky. But yeah. when you when you go out into the nature, when you study the natural world, when you go and do experiments in nature, you get very grounded. If you're a farmer, you're you're pretty grounded. It's city folk. Uh, you know, this is an old saw, but I mean, people, uh, the monks in the monastery or the city folk or whatever, can get really lifted off into esoteria and really ungrounded. And so their science and their philosophy can get ungrounded. You know, in yeah. science, we have people called hand wavers who say, "Well, what if such and such a system would work?" And theoretical biology just to draw these cycling things and this blah, 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 and they don't go to the trouble of going to experiment, looking down a barrel of a microscope, seeing how nature right. does it seem. And, and Dave's uh, big thing is that they ha- they're they so in love with their idea that they're terrified to test it because mm-hmm. it might falsify it. And whereas Dave's approach, he said, the best science is where you go and test your ideas as soon as you can to to find holes and falsify them so you don't go down those rabbit holes. So I would suggest to anyone in philosophy or spiritual inquiry or whatever, before you fall down your own rabbit hole, go and find a way to test it and demonstrate it. Otherwise, you're just going to live in that story your whole career. Yeah. And it, it, it may be you may be able to elaborate the story and get a lot of people to listen to you. But it's not truth. It's not seeking truth. And ultimately, you won't have the satisfaction of adding something true to human knowledge. 
Those are uh, profound words, and I hope our viewers take them seriously. I think, uh, as as I mentioned to you uh, last time we got to about this point in our discussion, my mentor, Arthur uh, M. Young, felt that philosophers are a dime a dozen, and philosophy failed to predict the enormous advances of, of technology. And he decided that you're not worthy of being a philosopher until you can show some mastery of the physical world yeah I think that in it, it really is that uh, I think that all uh, people of great mental acuity and capacity ought to in some part of their careers early on go and do practical things so that mm-hmm. they can be grounded because if they come out of the academy uh, full of what they think is value which is words and ideas, Dave, Dave talks about this all the time that yeah. so many words, so many words. I, I opened, when I was invited to the conference of science of consciousness by Stuart Hameroff, I, uh, went to get a book on consciousness and I opened it up and it was so opaque. It was, it was, it was so sloppy. It was, it was ridiculous. And I opened up another one and another one, another one. And I realized, my goodness, you know, no one has common terms. No one has a testable hypothesis. Uh, the words are flowery and nice, but no one's done a meta study of all this. And then I, I met Ken Wilber about two years ago and went mm. to hit, see him in Denver. And I realized this man has done that. This man has absorbed all of this stuff and come up with his whole ons and, and sort of developed this spiral dynamics idea and all this sort of stuff. And he's actually absorbed all this thinking to try to come up with a meta theory. But he's like one of the only people who has. And, and, and the rest of them are in their pigeonhole little silos with their own uh, belief system. Yeah. So, so there are very few meta theorists who are trying to get a handle on all this mass of stuff and come up with a common working hypothesis. Uh, Arthur Young, my mentor, was, is, is one such person. Uh, after inventing the uh, helicopter, he uh, r- began developing a meta-theory. It's published in his book, The Reflexive Universe. Uh, so, um, But you're right. There are very few people who think that way. Um, on the other hand, uh, I'm a parapsychologist. I uh, believe in the empirical method, and parapsychologists conduct experiments, and those experiments, many people would say, are pointing toward a uh, a different model of reality, uh, not a strictly materialistic model. Although that's controversial, we have materialistic parapsychologists as well. Jeffrey, you can help help me because in two months uh, from right about now, I'm the opening speaker at the IONS conference. Oh! Uh, the Insti- for, the, for your listeners and viewers, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, I'm their opening keynote. At, How uh, nice! Won- it's a wonderful meeting. It uh, It's on July 18th. There's a pre-conference, uh, which is yeah. to me just tremendous. And then there's a, and I'm doing the opening talk on the Friday, the 19th of July. And it's for the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landings on the moon. Because, of course, uh, Edgar Mitchell was the founder of IONS. Uh, So they have a strong connection with the Apollo project in space in the 60s. And and that's an organization that has sponsored a lot of parapsychology research. Right. So here I am. Am I walking? Am I mad? I mean, they, they, so they've asked me to to uh, bring them a vision of outer and inner space and how they're connected. Mm. Sure. So I could really use help from (laughs) you uh, having been around this far longer and having interviewed pretty much everyone from Russell Targ to help, I mean, help put off and all these people uh, and other viewers that what on earth, you know, what, what on earth and what in, you know, what outside the earth can I possibly bring to this group that will, connect with them uh mm-hmm. from my point of view which uh may be a bit of a balloon popper you know because I'm, I'm suggesting <laughs> i'm, I'm su- well at what i'm suggesting and maybe this is maybe i already have my own answer i mean they can pop my balloon feel free uh that this pim so here, here's what we'll we'll leave, we'll leave the audience with 
the, okay. the, or, the origin of life is based on the crowding, probabilistic crowding of things in protocells, which make them more likely. It's a machine for abiogenesis that first makes improbable things more probable. It's a probability increasing machine. You clump together the protocells and they form a network. So that's interaction. And then in that network rises memory, little short polymers that can read and write to make more polymers, uh, to do more jobs that are crowded together, that to bring miracles into existence. The miracle of the first enzyme coming out of the yeah. system. But that, that PIM system is driven by one process, which is that the sun, or the earth rotates to face the sun once a day, whatever, however long that day is. And you get this mm-hmm. incident solar radiation that hits the surface, high quality energy, driving, 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 starting with what drive cycling and then photo capture mechanisms, photosynthesis and things. And that that drives PIM, the PIM triangle, over mm-hmm. and over and over again, stacks it, stacks it, stacks it, stacks it, first slowly through this flat uh, base of microbial world that lasts for freaking 90% of the Earth's history without a whole lot of evolution going on. And then it hits a tipping point and it starts to climb. But it's still the, the, the stacking of PIM. So less probable things are emerging against the background of the cosmos. And then this spire, I call it the silver spire. I saw it in a vision one night. It goes up and all little blobs appear and fuzzy blobs. And those are the first multicellular entities, the first entities. In a sense. And then the spire is just ramming harder and harder up in a, through the human world. We're in this huge, blurring, huge thing. But the spire is a probability uh, gradient. So it's here's here's four billion years ago, here's today, and stuff is happening up here that is improbable beyond the history of ten trillion cosmoses to assemble on their own, like the smartphone. The yeah. smartphone floating in space is like I, I was going to draw a New Yorker cartoon, <laughs> try to sell it to the New Yorker, which has two universes next to each other, and one says that's Someone inside me has invented the smartphone. What do I do? <laughs> you know, because it, because it's so unlikely, you know, that the universe yeah. is, or what do I do? Uh, so we're on this probability spire. We're way up here. And that that probability and potentiated field off the base level of what the cosmos is about has properties mm-hmm. that we're only maybe being able to understand. What are the properties? Up here, we can shape the future probabilistically in in ways that are so far beyond the normal thermodynamics that it is a powerful effect of its own and it's through the matrix of the living world that all of our experience including our non-dual experiences including what seem to be miraculous synchronicities happening all around us and we explain it to the results of prayer or wish and a hope or just like wow it's a magical world that's because nature uh, rocks at shaping probability, and it's getting better and better and better, and it's the whole natural world. It's not just us. Nature can tweak probability and make seemingly miracles happen just over and over and over and over and over again. And when you get that dense of an interconnected feel with our phones and, and our communications, it's only increasing the power of that system. So it's a total lifting. And so the very property, we're floating in it, and it has the potential to almost deliver anything to a little primate brain. You mm-hmm. want that experience, you can get it, because you put intention mm-hmm. out. It actually, the intention is a server call into the probabilistic field that is so juiced up, it's got so much battery and charge, it can do it over and over and over again. Yeah. So it's a materialist, reductionist explanation of the rising of the system, and then the PIM thing, and then the cycling constant stacking with energy mm-hmm. with the sun sun's and radiation the networking effects and all this coming to the point where uh that is what is emerged and mm-hmm. we can now see it so more and more people can go into non-ordinary states and ex- and connect with that and when i get the message from that it's like don't characterize it too soon you know don't you know uh it's it's almost like a that that thing is intelligent on its own, but it's mm-hmm. made out of the living world. It's made out of all of us. It's made out of all of this and all of this lineage and long history. So it's mm-hmm. not something coming from outside. It's not a 
property of the cosmos as per se. It's a property of the miracle of, of planet Earth's existence and, and complex life's emergence and, and the sheer number of mm-hmm. connections and neural connections are brains. It's just it's made from this. So we're not denying, we're not we're not withdrawing ourselves and studying it. We it is actually it's what Ram Dass said, if we be here now, right in this moment, just be with it and be still and connect to this, then we realize this is what mm-hmm. is. This is all all that is. And and anything is a other is a projection. It's a mental kind of treatment of it. Uh so mm-hmm. we go back to what all the original teachers yeah told us which is to just be present uh, mm-hmm. and you're in the miracle be present in the miracle uh don't try to ideate it or ex- explain it or yeah. interpret it just be it <laughs> well bruce that was wonderful I, I i love that description it's brilliant i think many of our viewers who have watched other programs in this series will know that my point of view isn't identical to yours but i don't want to change you in any way because i'm learning so much this is, and I, I really appreciate the dialogue. Bruce, thank you once again so much for taking this time to be with me. It's a huge pleasure, and uh, you've got so many fans for what you've done over well over 30 years now, and it's, a, yeah. it's an absolute honor to be part of your lineage and, and, and your inquiry. Well, I, I feel the same way. Uh, about uh, having such a wonderful scientist uh, and and such a uh, I have to say polymath like yourself to uh, have these conversations with and I know the audience uh, after our last program they said bring him back we want more of him here we are and we're going to do it again yeah. and uh, please comment uh, for this show and we may pick up some of your your questions and if you make him yeah. make him intelligent don't just throw stuff out there do some do some <laughs> re- research on what you're saying uh, otherwise we just won't take it seriously but we will take no, but- uh, your your sentiments and uh, 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 your passions very seriously mm-hmm.